So now I just want to go through the um, answers, well, not the answers, but the, the output of what you're supposed to learn from the compiler ops performance uh, sheet here, which have, um, this is the one which we're concentrating on now. So what I've done is, I've done as we expected in the sheet, I've run um, uh, the, the program uh, on a single single CPU core. Um, for uh, three compilers, the three compilers are available on, on, on Archer, Cray, Intel, and GNU, and I've run them at various different optimization levels. And so I'll start off with no optimization, this, this graph here. What happens if you tell the, now, there, there's an enormous hierarchy between you know, the, CP, the code you write, the Fortran, or this, 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 all these examples are from Fortran, but I expect you get similar uh, answers in C. You'll see that this year I've offered a, a C example as well, but um, there's not a big difference there. The, the code you write to what actually runs on the processor, there's a lot of hierarchy there. And, and, and modern compilers are very clever and are able to do lots of things. But if you, if you do no optimization at all, you'll see um, a couple of interesting effects. First of all, you'll see that, um, that the, 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 pros, the, um, the compilers get very different performance from each other. That's because all these, all these definitions are relative. You know. What one, per, what one compiler considers no optimization might be different from what another one considers no optimization. But um, we're getting um, cell updates per second of, of here. Uh, that's, you know, 50 million, uh, 150 million, 250 million. Uh, they vary a lot between the compilers. And uh, in fact, the, um, the GNU compiler is the best here. Then, then Cray, then Intel. So if you tell the compiler, look, just, just, just compile the code and really just don't touch it, just produce stuff, you'll see this performance. And you might conclude here that the GNU compiler is, 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 um, is, is the best on Archer. Actually, what most people do is they just compile out the box and, and don't specify any options at all. So this is actually saying minus O0 says to the compiler, just do nothing, as little as possible. The default is just do your normal stuff. And there's quite a change in scale here because that the GNU compiler here, two and a half, 250 million, that is there at this point here. So you'll see that, in fact, by default, the GNU compiler does no optimization at all. So if you took these compilers out of the box and just ran them, you, you would actually um, do a different conclusion. You'd say, well, the GNU compiler performance is pretty awful, but the Intel and Cray, the Cray is the best and Intel's, um, you know, not so good, but they're all, they're all pretty good. And so you might say, if you, so you just log on to Archer, you compile your program, you might say, well, clearly I'm going to use the Cray or the Intel compiler and not the GNU compiler. But in fact, that's a bit um, of a red herring, because really, again, default is, you know, just do your normal stuff. But again, that's really, um, you know, do your, try as hard as you normally would, is basically what we're saying to the compiler. You know, how do, what does that mean? And the reason that, that, the out the box Cray and Intel try, as you might say, try harder than the GNU compiler is for a couple of reasons. First of all, the GNU compiler is 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 freely available and it's very portable, and it runs on a whole bunch of different of different platforms, different architectures all over the place. And so the GNU compiler is really focused, um, you know, on 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 keeping up to modern language standards, compiling anywhere, always producing code that works well. Clearly, Intel produce their compiler for their Intel processors. They want, if you use the Intel compiler, they want you to get good performance from the Intel processor and not complain. So they're going to they're crank up the optimization level quite high. Similarly, Cray, Cray think that you've bought a Cray compiler, a Cray, a Cray machine. Clearly, you want performance. So most, most people use the GNU compiler on their laptops or whatever. Oh, that bothered about performance. You know, modern processors are pretty fast. So it doesn't do it, you know, it doesn't doesn't really try that hard out the box, but the Cray and the Intel ones do, and they get a performance which is here, you know, four or five times faster. However, if you crank up the performance to to a much higher level, you will see that basically. Now I've got Python on here, and I'll I'll come back to that. But basically, updated cells per second is really pretty similar across the board. So if you do compiler optimization eleven three, see the Cray compiler is, is doing about the best and that's not surprising. You're running on a Cray machine, you know, the Cray compiler is going to be very targeted at that machine. But there's really not a huge difference between the three compilers. So so if you modern compilers are, are pretty clever and if you turn up the optimization level, tell them all to try their hardest, they're gonna get in most cases pretty much similar performance. You'll see here the Cray is is slightly better, but that's not surprising because uh, you're running on a Cray machine and it will know all the tricks uh, uh, for the Cray. Um, so the biggest reason why people say, you know, such and such a compiler isn't very good, it's 
in my experience, normally because they haven't tuned it correctly. They haven't really told it to really try its best. Python on here, um, the Python program we give you is, is, is achieving about half the performance of, of the compiled code. Now, normally I would say Python performance is what a couple of percent of compiled code. Um, but this, this Python example was written by my colleague Andy Turner, and what he's done here is he's used something called a uh, NumPy. There is a, there is a la there's a way of writing Python programs which is designed for doing very large array computations, and um, it uses something called, called um, uh, NumPy. So you have uh, array objects which you manipulate. And the basic point is that that gives you massively increased performance. Python is an interpreted language, so basically what it's going to do is it's going to say uh, it, has to, it has to interpret each line of your code, uh, you know, line by line. And if your line of your code says update array element ij, it'll go right. How do I do that? All right, I'll update array element ij. Right, what do you want to do next? Update array element ij plus one. Oh, I'll update element ij plus one. So for each Elemental update, updating each element in the array, it's, it's having to interpret your code and, and execute it. So it's, it's, it's a huge overhead. What, what the NumPy interface does is it basically says, look, I want you to update this entire array at once. So the interpreter says, right, oh, update this entire array, that's fine. And then that goes straight onto the hardware. So basically you, you're, you're, you're doing the, the overhead of the interpreter is, is once per array, which here are thousands by thousands, rather once per array, per array element. So this speed up here is re really due to using this NumPy interface. If you wrote naive Python, which was just uh, do, uh, looping over for each over each element, you would get terrible performance. So that's the, the, the first most important thing here is to show that no optimization, default optimization are really relative terms. They're compiler dependent. If you turn the optimization up high enough, then all the compilers are very much the same. But what you might notice is that um, that at very high, um, at very large system sizes, um, basically, no matter what you do, no matter what compiler you use, Cray, Intel, or GNU, no matter what optimization level you use, you get something here, round about, you know, Four, three or four um, hundred million array updates per second. Why is that? Well, this is back to our old bugbear that out here, very large system sizes, it doesn't really matter what the processor is doing. The performance is limited by access to main memory. So, you know, the compiler can do really clever things, but eventually it's limited. The, it may be able to process the data very quickly by doing clever things once the data is on chip. But getting the data in and out becomes the bottleneck. So if your memory bandwidth limited, you'll see that what compiler you use or even what optimization level you use that doesn't really have a huge amount of effect because that's not the limiting factor. And actually, this, going back this, on this chart, I've, I've actually quantified the um, some of these things. Uh, oh no, so on the next uh, the, a chart here, what I've done is I've started to investigate um, using the finite Reynolds number. So if I go back to the sheet you'll see that um, the fluid dynamics exercise, um, you'll see that you're, it was actually possible to turn on finite Reynolds number. What that means is, in this simple simulation, we don't let the, have any whirlpools, we don't let the, 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 um, um, the fluid circulate, and you get very um, unrealistic flow patterns. If you have finite Reynolds number, um, you get much more realistic flow patterns that the, that the, the fluid comes in here and you get these whirlpools, it all looks a lot nicer. That has a lot more, involves a lot more work. It actually involves an extra array. So rather than having two arrays to process, you have a third array, which, which actually encodes how much the, the circulation is going around. And you have a lot more floating point operations to do per iteration. And so on this chart, what I've done, this is the same data we had before running the, um, the, the code out of the box. And this is using a finite Reynolds number. And we have about, you can, um, we have about four floating point operations per iteration. Um, each array update takes about four operations with no Reynolds number, but with a finite Reynolds number, it takes a lot more, it takes about 18. So what you might do as a naive user, you might run these two programs. I've, I've turned the, the optimization level up really high on different system sizes, and look at the floating point operations per second. And you might be a bit confused. You might say, well, you know, this program has about three gigaflops going down to about one. And this program has about five gigaflops going back to about two and a half. Why is this program twice as twice as fast as this one? Well, the important point is, 
it's not that that's limiting you, it's the data transfer. So if you actually, com if you actually don't compute the, the floating point operations per second, but compute the data transfer rate, here you have to take into account that each iteration process is two arrays, here each iteration process is three arrays. You can, if, if you compute the data transfer rate, you'll see that both programs have very much the same features. They start off running about 12 gigabytes per second, going down to about five or six for very large system sizes. So you know that that will that shows you that um, that the only reason that the finite Reynolds number calculation goes faster in terms of floating point operations per second is it just does more floating point operations with the same amount of data. Once it's read the data, it does more floating point operations. But if you look at it in terms of data transfer rate, you'll see that they're both limited by the same thing. And so if we look at, for example, um, um, the data transfer rate. You'll see that we get this, you know, this effect that it starts off high and drops down again. And this is using a real program, but uh, we showed you some results in the lectures from a, a synthetic um, benchmark, the Streams benchmark, which I'll show you here. So this is just a synthetic benchmark, which does nothing more than read and write data. And on Archer, you'll see that we see these three effects. We see the this is the level one cache. Again, um, that, it's almost too small to see in the CFD example. But most the thresholds we were seeing was basically uh, this level two in the middle here. When you get reasonably good performance, this is le this is level three, and this is out out to, out to main memory. And you might think that these data transfer rates look about twice what I have here. So if I, you might be, think that this isn't very quantitative because when I did these results for the um, CFD example, I was getting numbers which started out at, you know, 10, 10 or 15 megabytes per second going down to about five or six. And this seems to start out at like, this seems to be like twice that. This is like 30 going down to about 12. But that's probably because these streams results are taken across the entire uh, Archer node. And the Archer node has two CPUs, and each of those are completely independent. So these st streams results are for the entire node. They're all double what you'd get from a single from a single CPU, and because we're running a, a single a serial program, people are running on one CPU. But the idea here is to show you that if you look at, if you take a calculation and you 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 look at its performance in the right way, and here the right way is to look at the limiting factor. The limiting factor is data transfer. You can actually predict. Uh, what that's going to do, either from looking at the architecture of the machine and looking at the, the cache sizes, or by comparing to synthetic benchmarks like streams, which do nothing more than read and write data. So this kind of thresholding effect is what we saw in the in the real example. So hopefully that was useful and will help you uh, in will actually help you in the second exercise where we're we're going to ask you to do similar performance studies of this program, the CFD program, but running in parallel.